it is not up to me to tell anyone else how to vote. My concern is that, one, not voting, and also voting on education. I mean, just voting because. Like, I mean, <clears throat> so for me growing up, there was an option. There was either a Democrat or a Democrat. Mm -hmm. that, that was it. Like, it didn't matter who's, who's a Democrat, it didn't matter who's a Republican. But guys, man, it's 2020. You need to vote according to what's important to you. That's why representation in the black community is so important. And representation doesn't just look like somebody that has your skin color. Like representation looks like someone that represents what's important to you, what's important to your community, what's important to your family. And when we vote, we shouldn't just think about, okay, I'm voting today, but how does that affect the next four years, the next eight years, the next 20 years? If you think about it, the vote is most is your most critical weapon not just nationally, but locally. So to me, I, I guess the short answer is, I'm not telling you to vote Democrat, I'm not telling you to vote Republican. I have my ideas. We all have our ideas, but I think it's important for you to vote according to what's important to you and what matters in our community. I think that's a great point, and I really appreciate your answer. Um, piggybacking off of what you said, I really think that, I feel like the younger generation now has a chance. There's a lot more information available. You can learn about those different things. You can become, you can say that you're an independent and know what that means. Like yourself, when I was coming up all like, Democrat, you, growing up as a Democrat, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I want to be a Democrat right get older. Maybe I agree with some of the Democratic views, some of the Republican views. That's when the independent comes in. But then on the local level, we don't know. A lot of times we don't know what's going on in the communities and how to get involved one of those city council meetings and that kind of thing because we never we never had that opportunity. So how how do we, how do we do that? How do we get involved and get in those circles and get in those rooms to where we can be a part of the conversations that make some things happen in our own community that benefit our kids like you mentioned earlier. Well I have a question then since you mentioned that what does representation look like and is it even important for the black community to be represented in politics? You know what, the representation, it starts with us. It starts in here with us. You know, we have to represent the black people. We have to represent five kids. So I'm sure everybody in here has kids. And we got to teach them like our mothers and fathers taught us when we were coming up. Because when I, was, when I was coming up, when I first got out of high school and I started going to college, I didn't vote. I, I wouldn't vote at all. Because I didn't think, you know, I heard people say, well, your vote don't matter. But my grandfather, he sat me down there and he told me, he said, listen, he said, let me tell you something. He said, we march in the streets for your behind, for the right to vote. If you're going to tell me you're not going to go out and vote, that's your right to vote. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take what they taught us and take it to our kids, and we're supposed to vote because our vote do count. And we need to make sure that our kids know that our vote counts because it do count. And that's one thing that we haven't been doing. I'm saying that we haven't been letting the kids you know, the younger generation, you know, the ones that's in college, the ones that's in high school, let them know they vote count because it counts. I mean, that's how you, that's how we represent ourselves as a black community. That's how we get strong. That we come together, we go out to the polls, and we vote. If you vote, if you don't vote, you can't. What you gotta say if you don't vote? If you vote, then you got a right to say whatever you want to say, express your opinion. But if you don't get up to go to the polls and vote, you don't have anything to say. And that's what my grandfather told me. He said, if you don't vote, what you going to say? You going to sit back on your mind and not vote, but you going to stand here and complain, but you wouldn't go out to the polls and vote. So it's very, very important for us to go out and vote, for our kids to know, even the little ones, let them know. Look, when you get bigger, your vote counts. My son is nine years old. And I'll let you know, when you, when you get a badge, you go vote. That's, that's your right. That's what your ancestors ran. Walk, walk the street. Martin Luther King and march so we could vote. So that's what we need to do. We need to be strong about everything that's going on. We need to research everything that's going on. Research your candidates. If, 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 I ain't saying all Democrat candidates are right. Facts. But research, you have to get the facts of what's going on. And then you make your decision. And that's how we that's how we are going to get stronger as black people, especially young black men. That's what we talk about. The young black men, you know, the old ones, they moved on today, you know, the older generation 
a lot of times it's set in their own ways. But we're the generation that's coming up now, that, that's rising, and we need to make sure that the generation below us know what's going on. Let them know. Guys, y'all got a right to vote. Go vote. Your comments remind me of John Lewis. He's in control. Yeah. 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 We all know the power of getting in, in good trouble. And what he represented is what you're talking yeah. about right now. Dude. I would even add to that point that you just made. Um, because I believe, I believe there's a, a valid additional point that needs to be made. That generation that you're talking about that taught you about the importance of voting, it, it mattered to them because they saw the marches. The generation that we're teaching right now, they don't have a, a visible example of a struggle and to see people overcome. It makes the conversation even more important, but we can't just have the conversation. We have to show these kids some of these things that our people went through. Um, Emmett Till being an example. Like, they have to understand why the fight was so big to, to have the right to vote so it'll matter. Me looking at a 13 year old and saying, you need to vote because your ancestors fought for this, it doesn't resonate with them. They need images, they need video, they need us to really be um, very persistent with the content that we put in front of them. They fill their eyes with so much other stuff that will not benefit them anything. It's up to us, you're absolutely right. As men, I have four kids. I have to sit them down. I have a 14 year old son and I just had this conversation with him two weeks ago. He wants to go to Harvard. And I told him, I said, this is the thing. I work in, in corporate America. So he knows what I, I, some of the things I've gone through. I said, because you're black and you're young, as unfair as this sounds, you're going to have to be twice as good. You're going to have to show earlier than everybody else. You're going to have to be willing to work later than everybody else until you prove your worth. It's not fair, but that's the situation that we're in. Um, and when he wrapped his mind around that, he's, he really kind of subscribed to the grind. And I think we're, go, we're coming into a generation now where we have grinders in we had a generation, I'm 37, we didn't necessarily understand how to grind for a long time because a lot of the generation that preceded us rested on the success of the generation that came before them. They inherited a lot from their, 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 their fathers and grandfathers and they kind of lived on that. We didn't have a lot of conversation about education, about anything else. So when we get to the vote and how important it is, we don't have images that are valid as of right now. We got to put that back in front of our kids. To your point, I agree. At this point, I don't care who you vote for as long as you exercise that right. Because I understand now what went into that fight, but we're not having that conversation with the level of intensity that you got it at. And you got it at that level of intensity because your, your, the ones that preceded you actually saw it and they lived in segregation. I got a 71 year old aunt. Now I appreciate having the conversations with her about how the schools were segregated. I appreciate having conversations with her about living here, and they had to run to get home because of, because of racial activity that was going on in the city. But if we don't have those real raw conversations, we can't just say you need to do this and leave it at that. We gotta give real legitimate examples, things with information that they can Google and find and verify. These kids verify everything now. Like, you can't, just, you can't just throw up a fallacy at these kids and expect them to take it. They're going to take what you say and then go validate it. Everything from scripture to stories and everything in between. And they will form their own opinion, but we have to tell them the truth. I don't think we're telling our kids the truth about how ugly those situations were. We expect them to just subscribe to a dialogue because we feel good about it. No, we got we to be ugly. And it's unfortunate, but we got to be ugly with the, with, with the details. And kind of think back, since we're talking about representation and how it's important. Um, I'm just thinking about what you just said in regards to telling your children they got to work twice as hard. Mm -hmm. um, how many generations have had to pass that down to, to generations coming up? Like, I, my mama told me that. My grandmama told her that. I had to tell my kids that. I'm tired of that. Um, and I, growing up, I played video games. I still play video games now. And I don't know if y'all familiar with this, but when you like 21 somebody, you tell them to do what? Pass the sticks. Pass the sticks. I think now we need to start telling folk that don't look like us that y'all been running this country for a long time. It's time for y'all to pass the sticks. Um, and that's why representation is important. Um, and if you look at the candidates, I don't know if y'all pay attention to what folks say, but when they talk about the black community, they act like we just this monolithic community. When they talk about when, they, when they're doing stuff for black folk, um, 
they always talk about the hood. They all talk, they talk about the hood and they talk about like you know government stuff. How the government comes in to help, as if we are a people that are just dependent upon the government. Yeah. I can look around the room right now. I got fraternity brothers in here who are doing well off. So when I want, what I want to hear from candidates, I don't want them to just talk about like us as if we are just poor people who are uneducated who don't have a chance. But I want them to actually talk about certain certain things that they can do to help us, you know, actually advance. Where we don't have to work twice as hard. But we I sit at those tables now. When I sit at those tables and I look at people that don't look like me, who make decisions, who are not don't have the education level that I have, but they're able to make certain decisions that actually have impact on my life. I just think about how unfair it is and how you know how we should all be over that because we are in a place now where you know they just really need to pass the sticks. I mean, I don't know, they need to pass the I need to pass the mic too. Oh, oh, it's only one fraternity. Let's be very clear. It's only one. I mean, it's only one. I mean, I guess the oldest is the co. I mean, you know what the one fraternity is, right? The oldest, the oldest, the the coldest. The Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Alpha Phi Alpha Phi. Alpha Phi. Alpha Phi. Alpha Phi. Alpha Phi.
I will say that it's even more important to have representation locally than it is national. So, so you asked a couple of questions. But, <laughs> but to, to circle. Uh, okay, okay. Can I stand behind you? Oh, I'm to speak up. You know what I mean? Okay. To circle back to what you were talking about in terms of what representation looks like, I think that's true that it looks like us. But we also got to remember that, yeah. like Johnny was saying, we're not running, right? And so, a lot of times people think that a black person in the seat, or a black person in position, or another person of color, you know, another, another black body, means that people are represented. And unfortunately, it's not the case. We can look at examples of the Supreme Court. <laughs> we, can look at, we can look at examples of government yeah. and see that that's not the case. So, I mean, how do you deal with that, though, right? You can't have any, you can't have like a test. You can't say, hey, how dumb are you, right? So it looks like numbers. It looks like more of us. So that more of our experiences and more of our perspectives are represented, right? And how do you do that? Not totally. <laughs> so, so if if you don't if you don't let your voice be heard, if you don't vote for candidates that share your viewpoints, your perspectives, and your experience, then you can't expect to have candidates that share your viewpoints, your perspectives, and your experience. It's just that simple. You know what I mean? So that's a couple of questions. I think that you did. <laughs> Yeah, and I was about to say, my very first question would be why. Yeah. My very first question would be why. Give me my. my. My why is because we are we are great at starting in our community, but we're not, we're, we tend to not be passionate enough to finish. And so the why matters so much more than the position. We are, we are being um, conditioned to want a platform, we're conditioned to want a position, but we're not necessarily conditioned to have the right heart posture for the places that we want to be in. So if I talk to a 25 year old that wants to be in politics, my first question is always going to be why? Are you legitimately passionate about improving the condition of your community? Or do you want to sit in the cool seat? Because that's where people are striving to go viral. Striving to, striving to have as many followers as possible. Striving to have as many views as possible. And the truth is, when, you, when you're really out there doing the dirty work, until you mess around and quote unquote, get made, those things don't come with that work. I believe in being able to go stay on the street corner and encourage these guys to do something with themselves. And I'm not taking selfies with them, we just having conversations about how we can build community. That's, that's, that kind of passion is necessary in order to be successful for a 25 year old that wants to be in politics. And if they don't possess that passion, we're not having a conversation. Because all the other mechanics of it don't matter. Your heart's not in it. And I, I agree with that same statement because I'm in, I'm in college right now, I go to UNCW. And last year, I was the president of the NAACP chapter at UNCW. And I would consistently have meetings, uh, tell them about what's going on in the local NAACP. Uh, events and ways you can get involved not just at UCW, but in the local level. But when it came down to like voting for just New Hanover County, it was a struggle just to get my e-board out there. And it was like, if y'all my e-board and y'all claim that y'all committed to this, why are y'all not showing up? And like I like I said, like it's all about trying to be viral. Where I think we're like my generation is like an era of like we're just we're gonna follow the hype. If it's not trending on Twitter, we're not we're not really invested in it. So yeah, I, I have a, like that's one of the questions I was gonna ask is how do you get young people like myself, young people in college, young people 25 years old to get actually invested and to really actually go out there and commit to voting? Because we do have, we don't have the same experiences or the same amount, amount of tape that older generations have when it comes to all this, the struggles and the suffering they had to go through. But we do have current things that's going on in our lives right now. Let me ask you a question. What, what made you, I think it's I really want to hear his response to my question. 
what made you so civically minded? What made you so passionate and all of you? I'm curious to know. So, yeah, okay, so tell me what, what, what got you there. One thing for me is that I've always been a forward thinker. I've always think about the future. I can't really stay in the present because you don't know where you, you like, you won't know if you're going, if you, if you don't have no goals, no plans. So my thing was, I'm always, I, I want to do what's best for the community. I want to do what's best that's going to help my nephew or my niece. Why? Why? Because I want them to live in a better world than my better world, a better society that I lived in, my ancestors, the people that came before them. Where did that come from? Is that just a name in you? Or did someone, you know, did you see parents modeling that behavior? You come from the community where you saw that type of attitude. Like, where did that come from? You know, is that just you? Oh, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that just comes from me just actually taking a mission on my own and actually looking up on the internet, like, what's going on in the life? Because I'm a military child. So I've lived a pretty decent life. I never really had to struggle as much as other people. So I've actually had to take the mission of like, okay, let's, let's look at other people's, what's other people going on in the world? Let's look from their perspective. And just because one person, like myself, is living a decent life, that doesn't, I don't represent the total population of the community. So you have a variety of diversity of perspectives. Yes. Were your parents uh, politically focused and involved? So my mother is politically involved, but my father was not. I think the first time he voted was actually during the Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump rally. But just like, I really got invested into this when, I think, when Barack Obama got uh, elected in. And just waking up that morning and just hearing my mother wake me up from the screams of having someone who would represent us in the uh, in office, I was like, why, why is this so important? Because like, I. I but generally did not have any knowledge of it before. But just seeing like the excitement and the joy that came from having someone who was who planned to represent us made me want to yeah, maybe want to yeah, 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 it made me want to do some more research. I'm like, okay, well why why is having someone in the president of office gonna make a difference? I think too we have to also understand that like in, in my case um, I grew up uh, in, a, in a Baptist church. My dad was the chairman of the deacon board. Um, so I was always that child that had, and mind you, there's five of us. And I'm always that child that has the longest Easter speech. Why? <laughs> you got four of the boys. I mean, I'm trying to think, why am I the one? Um, but for me, now I understand it a little bit better. I understand putting me out there in that forefront, what that did for me. Um, I was also that child that was always the nosy one and would always ask why. Um, you know, why, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Or I was always the child that wanted to go somewhere. So when my dad went to go vote, I went to go vote. So I got to see it. It was a part of it was a part of what my a part of my everyday life. Um, we and, and he made it a point to do that for me. So I look at my brothers now, and I look at the struggle that they that I fight with them every year about, and I work at this, and I fight with one of them every single year about going to vote. Every year, we have the same conversation, but we didn't. We grew up in the same household, so I got to see it. I got to be a part of it. I was a part of what was going on. Um, I was also the one again that was put out there to do certain things. Um, so I feel like, too, a lot of times when we take that initiative with, with our youth, and even even older ones, even ones that are 15, 16, 17, it's not too late for them to go and say, hey, look, hey, why are we up here real quick? So you can see what this process looks like, involving them in that process. They are no longer involved. We, we depend on education. That's not it anymore. It's not. If they're no longer in their city, so it's not in school. School was shut down. When I, when I was growing up, school shut down um, for election day. And prior to that, the week before, you had a whole week of got, getting to learn what it was about because they wanted to bring in the machines and things to see how they worked when they test them with the kids, you know, to figure out how they worked, and even if they didn't work. They no longer do that. We don't have that option anymore. So we have to make it a point as a community to say, hey, look, come out with me. Come do this, come do that. 
um, and make them a part of that process. That changes the thought process and it also changes how we think and how our youth think as they, as they get older. So when we say, ask them why, oh, because I'm not part of that process. I know what it looks like. I want to do that. I actually want to be a part of my community and change that. I was a part of that. That's, that's how we get to the why. I agree. I got it. I don't need two mics. I already talked to him. <laughs> I just want to make sure you ask the answer to this question because I think, I mean, he's, he's I don't know if you're 25. I don't know if you're 25. I don't know. So he has to Oh, yes. I want to make sure we ask the question, though. No, I am not. I am not interested in politics. not interested to be a politician. Oh, I'm just not interested in politics. Why would I be here? That's right. 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 <laughs> so, so if somebody is interested in being a politician, I don't think the first question I ask them is why. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> and I think we got to be careful too as black folk, because I think we too can make it hard for each other right. when we don't, other folk don't get asked that same question. Um, so I would, I would actually point them into a direction of black folk who are already doing this work. Um, and just kind of encourage them to kind of learn under them and see how they can, you know, glean whatever they can glean from them and if they want to pursue that route. Um, I'm also, I think somebody brought up the church, um, growing up in the church, I mean, I'm, I mean it, there's a lot of pastors in here, believe it or not, but um, and, uh, me growing up, voting is something that was talked about often, you know, in, in sermons and stuff. Like, we, when it was voting season, pastors would talk about getting people out to vote. And I think, you know, from a Christian standpoint, I think what we need to do, we talk about, um, we, we spend a lot of energy and time um, in both the spirituality, um, but oftentimes we all we leave out practicality, and that's never helpful. So I think, too, as like spiritual organization, we have the ability to encourage people to get out and participate in both versus Versus, versus telling them to just wait on Jesus to save their lives. Um, because I don't think God is interested in actually coming down here and doing the work that we can actually do for our own self. So, can I ask you a question, Brother Jeremy? Do you think that no, no, I have no question to be able to ask. Record me, man. You know. No, no. Um, do, you, do you think, what do you, what's your thought on the church or, or, or the clergy encouraging people to vote for specific people? Well, so, okay, I mean, that's two parts to that. There's two parts to that. There's two parts to that, so. I mean, because we see what's happening with Trump, We see right? what's happening with the we evangelicals, and uh -huh. I, I hate when people misuse scripture to encourage people to vote for a particular candidate. So when we say that this candidate is you know, against abortion for one thing. And we automatically assume that, you know, this candidate, that we should vote for this candidate because they are against abortion while at the same time overlooking all the other crazy stuff this candidate participates in. I think, to me, that's unethical and I don't think we should be um, encouraging people based on that. But on the other end, I do think that there are moments when we have to strongly encourage folk to vote for their best interest. Um, because sometimes people just, they just don't know. They just don't know. Especially when you talk about the local candidates. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the, the national candidates, but when you talk about the local level, people really just don't know. So maybe it's helpful. Like in, in black church spaces, it's, it's easy for you to see different candidates come into your churches on Sundays. You know, I mean, they probably only come that one Sunday out of the whole next year. You won't see them again. But you'll see them come in and, you know, kind of talk about their platform. Um, but I'm telling y'all to vote for Biden. So, as a <laughs> so as a as a uh, as a secular as a secular individual, right? As a, a secular individual, free thinker, as a yes. person who's, who's not really affiliated with religion, that that I like that, but it also makes me uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Because. I, I agree with you when I agree with the candidates that they put. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so I, there's a space. There's a space for people who are encouraging people to vote. I think there's a space for, it, you know, maybe being open 
to answer any questions in terms of how does a, a policy get along with scripture. You know, that's that's how you live. However, there's so much power here. You know what I mean? That that makes me uncomfortable. So I, I honestly, it's, that's a complicated answer. So how, how do we bridge that gap? Then? How do we bridge that gap? Yeah. I think it's about people acting in good faith, who who understand the power that they have and believe in an individual's right to make a decision based on their conscience and their beliefs, whether, even when it's a part of their conviction. So I think there are people who have power that respect that power, and then there are people who abuse that power. You know what I mean? So, Thank you. I think it's critically important that as the the church, in particular the black church, I think it's critically important because we are not monolithic to always be open to informing people. Uh, I think it's very dangerous when we want to use our spaces to particularly uh, support a particular agenda. But I do think it's important to have the space for people to receive information. And based on information, people are informed to make whatever decision. I'll give you an example. I grew up in a Black Baptist church that you would say was a mega church, right? right? So election season, it was not uncommon to have the Republicans show up. And it was not uncommon, definitely not uncommon, to have the Democrat person show up. And my pastor's point was, everybody in my congregation may not vote the way I vote, but it is important that people are voting and that people have access to information to make whatever informed decision that they make, that they make right? And not during election season, also doing voter education, right? So that when election season comes, I'm talking about the black church, right? Uh, that everyone cannot say in our particular church that they didn't have access to information. So there was always, I, and I guess because, and I, and I say this in a very sensitive way, as a clergy, and I'm not demeaning clergy, that uh, have not had the same um, experience that I've had in terms of um, being being a seminary, and I'll say it that way. And, and so my so 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 so, so, uh, so it is it is dependent upon. I will say this: how that particular clergy person is formed, and how they think about God. Because I'll say this. Your, and I say theologically, your anthropology, how you see humans, mm -hmm. informs your theology. Absolutely. Very preach, preach. So if you if you don't see me as human, and you don't and you think of me in terms of, or you, you think of each other in terms of morality all the time, which which is debatable, then you're going to particularly align with that which you think is going to align with your moral values. But if you see humanity has always evolving, then you want to think about humanity differently. And that's all of us, because all of us are on a spectrum. None of us started out as a free thinker. We evolved. We evolving into being a free thinker. Are we evolving into conservative ideology or, or progressive ideology or moderate ideology. And one of the other things that is listening to the conversation that I think is important in the black community is education or education beyond just talking points. Okay? We have to educate people on the origin of ideas, on the origin of politics, because that is, is, is most important. Because if I don't know origin, then I'm just going off of what mama told me. I'm going off what daddy told me. And I may not necessarily agree with that. So what is Marxist thought? What is, where, where does Socrates, Aristotle play in this? 
How, how does those philosophical ideas influence the way we see one another? You know, so so it's a deeper conversation than just voting when particular elections come about. Got yeah, one quick point. You know, everybody said uh, says that things don't happen in the vacuum. The only vacuum that truly exists is birth. So we're all free thinkers at birth. Exactly. We're all free thinkers at birth. Well, well, all right. No, no, it's not because what informs you is the stuff you get from society. Your parents. Well, yes, that's that's the that's, 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 so here, here, here's here's the question. Said, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 everything yeah. else. <laughs> All right, so here's a, here's a question for the barbershop. Is there a black political party? And if so, no. why? No, there's not one. Okay. Oh, right. So there's a the formation of one at one time. <laughs> what, Aaron Wilson? Not in Wilmington, but there was thoughts between, I forget who it was, between people oh, no. of that and one now. Oh, no, 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 no. no. I think right now it's not really a black political party because all the what they want it doesn't coincide with what we need. You know what I'm saying? So right now we have white politicians that are in places that are putting policies in places that only benefit them. You know, so as far as what we need in our communities, like right now, marijuana is getting black kids arrested every single day. Every single day. Clergy, pastors, they get behind it as a policy change that affects black people tomorrow to keep black kids from being able to get an apartment or get a loan, or be able to live a regular life. You know, so uh, criminal justice reform, there's nobody really attacking the real issues that we're dealing with right here in our communities. They tell us to deal with Democrats because this is the way to go. They tell us to deal with the Republicans because we make more money. But what about the real issues that we're dealing with psychologically, right? Who's helping us there? That's where really a lot of our, our issues stem from. Psychologically, we haven't been able to come through the trauma that we've been born with, so. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. So I'm an independent voter, yeah. right? I'm, I'm, I'm a free thinker. Yeah. Like so I'm not registered with a political party. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never be registered with a political party because I believe that ideas should stand and fall by themselves, no matter where they come from. Okay? We all should evaluate ideas on their merits. That's what I think. Unfortunately, I tend to vote Democrat because most of the, the ideas, uh, most of the people who have any semblance of ideas, that's what it, that to me that are based in that are based in fact are on the democratic ticket. Uh, but one day, who knows? I'm gonna be independent in their home, right? But I but I, I think that I think that we need to as a as a people think about the fact that and politicians really need to be honest about how change happens. You know, I think that a lot of times they make a lot of wishes, I mean a lot of promises. That, that just because of the way politics happens and the way that the bureaucracy happens and, and, and political uh, political will and, and public opinion moves, it's hard for things to happen. So that doesn't mean that you don't work and you don't push and you don't press, but it means that you stay engaged. So you come out during uh, political season and then you just walk away and expect the politicians to handle everything. But we have a responsibility to keep the pressure on, right? I, I heard Stacey Abrams say, uh, the politicians respond, they're like teenage girls, they respond to money, uh, peer pressure, and attention, mm -hmm. right? And that's true. Right. So, you know what I mean? It, there, there is a role for us to play to ensure that they are communicating with us, being honest with us, and pressuring them about what, what is happening, why it's, it is happening, what's causing it not to happen, all the way through. Because that's how change happens. We also, again, need to be realistic about the fact that when these guys, one person is not going to come in and fix everything. These are systems. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so they need to be more honest. But unfortunately, a lot of times if they're honest, they're not going to get the votes, right? That's, you know, it's, it's, it's self uh, 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 you know. <laughs> that word. Yeah. Danielle, we, uh, we, we talked about, you know, like last week we were talking about, um, we did an HBCU tour in um, Benville, we did Shaw, Livingstone, Auntie, and we were talking about um, We the People, Black uh, Black Voters Matter, NC Black Alliance, um, and NC AT, they helped us out too. And so what we talked about though is after the election, that that's where the real work begins. And actually holding people accountable 
and understanding that there's a process to that, but people don't understand that either. You know, you said peer pressure. That means throughout this whole election process, we still gotta be out here. You know, we as the black men, as the pillar, and the black strong women like Danielle, we have to push them up as well, and we have to support each other the same way and listen to each other speak and get these ideas out to understand where, because nobody has an answer, really. Nobody here has given an answer. We just trying to figure it out, but that's where it starts, though. And also realizing that the enemy, what are they using to beat us? Let's be real about that. We getting beat by social media. We getting beat by TikTok. We getting beat by Twitter, like you said. So how do we infiltrate these spaces so that we're the ones running these spaces to, to infiltrate these people's minds and hearts? And so, yeah. I got a question. Can I ask you two more? Yeah, go ahead. The question I have, I just thought about it. When you said the word trauma, it triggered me like crazy. Yeah. Because the issue is, when I sit around and look at this room right now, I'm gonna be very honest, I'm gonna be very candid, because we're in the barbershop. It's a shame that we gotta sit around and talk about black folks matter. Right. There, there's, no, there's, there's, there's no room for the white men that are talking about white folks matter. Right. The problem that we have, and I pose this as a question to this entire shop, the truth is, our community doesn't believe our votes matter because we go and vote and nothing changes about our condition. How do we get to a point where we can really infuse belief that our vote is going to change something? How do we how do we get to a point where we believe again that it matters? Because the act of it is a thing. We can get to like get people to the polls, but the fact that we don't necessarily believe that our condition is going to change, I think that's what keeps a lot of us away from the polls. Like I go because I get it. And I believe because I, I've seen it, it can happen, but I can't tell that to a mother of four children who lives on her own in the projects that if she votes a certain way, her condition is gonna change. You know what I mean? Like we have to be able, the, the education is key, but how do we, we can give a whole bunch of facts, but how do we infuse belief again in our community? Thanks. 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 Part of uh, what we do, and I had this conversation yesterday with some um, some young people that literally we get into this we get into this mode in, in the work that I do. We get into this mode this time of year. We need all these different people helping us. So you know, we got all this grant money. We out here. We hiring folks or whatever. But come November third, these folks know that that's it. And so they struggle with that. They're like, how, you know, we, we've been going hard all these, all these couple of weeks and then, then that's it. So having this conversation with them yesterday, I said, told them, I said, what we say, we say black voters matter. We say that and we have an integrity behind that. We believe that. We are a 365 organization. And how I get you to believe that you matter is I take you with me. I might not be able to pay you for this very second, but I'm still going to take you with me. Those young folks sent me their, their email addresses, uh, social media handles, phone numbers, everything yesterday. Because they're like, take me with you. Let me see what you're talking about. Teach me whatever else I'm supposed to know surpassing this. We have to take it upon ourselves to bring these folks with us. We have to take it upon ourselves and be in these communities and be in these spaces. That mother of four that you're talking about, okay, cool. You know what? I see. I see. I'm going to show you how you matter to me. Why? How am I going to show you this? I'm going to take you. You got to go to work? Okay, cool. Let me let me rock with your kids for a little bit. Let me, let me have a conversation with them. Let's take them to the playground for a little while while you go handle what you need to handle. Let me show you how you matter to me. Let me, because... Ultimately, I want to build something in you to where you can own your own. You can have your own, and you can change your own. You can change it for yourself. But you can be on the be on these be on this bus. Take, and we spend thousands, we spend millions of dollars. I didn't want to say thousands anymore. We spend millions of dollars in voter registration and getting people to the polls, but we don't spend a dime in accountability. We do not take these, we don't take anybody to the city council meeting. We don't call folks until the, uh, to the board of election meeting until something's about to go down. Why is that? Most of these folks in the communities that these, these issues affect don't even know who sits on these boards and make these decisions when it comes to our children going to school every day. They don't have a clue. 
So why are we not taking it upon ourselves in the work that we're doing, in the work that I do, why are we not building some type of accountability process and plan? My partners right now, they know for a fact, come November 4th, I'm calling you. Why? Because I want to know what your accountability is. I want to know what you're doing in your community surpassing this. I want to know how we can take that accountability plan and fund it and get it out there so that you can do this work surpassing. We don't know what November the 4th is going to look like politically, but we know what it looks like every single day. Right. It's that simple. So if we have to learn to change the narrative, change our thought processes, change it and make it a 365 conversation in these communities and, and let people know how much they truly matter, it's going to take us instilling that in people. Our parents, in order for us to know that we matter, they let us know that. They they told us that. We got to do the same thing to our brothers and sisters instead of tearing them down. Instead of saying, you know what? Oh, you live over there. That's too good for me. I ain't going over there. It's, it's 6 o'clock. Oh, I'm not going down that street. No, we have to be, be more than that. We have to do more than that. And we have to take that on as a community because ain't nobody, hey, y'all, we all we got. Ain't nobody going to do it for us. That's right. Point blank. They prove that every single time. Even the ones that look like us prove that every single time is in political position. So we have to go out here and do it for ourselves, and we have to learn how to take what we got right now. We got momentum going right now. We got folks' attention right now. How do we keep that attention? How do we show them that you matter? We love you. We got you. No matter what it's like, we here for you. Instead of turning our back on them and going to rest, I'm tired, y'all. I am tired. <laughs> November 4th can't come fast enough for me. But at the same time, I know what November 4th looks like for my community, so I'm still in it. We all have to have that mentality at this point. As somebody who does this work, I got a question for you. As somebody who does this, hold on. Right. Someone, someone asked, like, how do we how do we get the people to feel hopeful that things can change? And sometimes I feel like it's, it's, a lot of it is how we talk about things because there's a lot that needs to change. There's a right. lot that hasn't been done. There's a lot of promises that have been made that haven't been fulfilled, true. But I feel like it, when we talk about it, we also need to talk about how, how those efforts have produced fruit, how things have changed, how being politically active and letting your voice be heard has moved the needle. You know, and I think a lot of times people just don't understand how their lives have been made better or how it's been made worse depending on who's in power, right? And so we need to figure out a way to, to, to connect these people's everyday lives to, to politics. And I think that we also need to maybe talk about these things in a way that, 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 that recognize progress, that recognize when, I mean, there are a lot of people, for instance, the ACA, right? A lot of people who are like, oh, I hate Obamacare, but don't take my health insurance, my ACA, right? They have, they have no clue how those policies were influencing and making their lives better, even in the hood, right? Access to education, who you get to love, who, you know, uh, what type of school you're gonna go to. I mean, all of those things matter, even in the hood. Even while you're living in the hood, what that experience in the hood looks like, you know, the term is determined by whose policies are, are getting employed. Do you have an opportunity to make it out if you want to, right? You get to go to college. I mean, how easy is it to go to college? So, I mean, do we, is there a space for how we talk about those things that, that keeps the pressure on, that, that keeps us motivated and, and, and recognizing how things still need to change, but also drawing that, those connections about how things have changed so that people can feel that it's possible. You know what I mean? It absolutely is. I think you need, one of the biggest things that we don't do as, 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 a, as a people, that we, we don't celebrate each other enough. You know, one of the things we, we love doing is we love being at the polls after you stand, stood in line and as you coming out the door, we love celebrating you. And I think we need to celebrate our wins a little bit more and so that people can see what those wins look like. And they can see, it might even be the smallest thing under the sun, but let's celebrate. Let, let's have a discussion about it. Let's have this, you know, where, they, where we're bringing something positive. We're not talking about nothing every day, we just don't talk about everything that, that has happened, that what we have progressed. And then from there, what do we want to see next? Like, give me that next piece. What do we want to see next? 
um, when we start doing that, you, it's amazing how you see a, somebody go in. They may have voted every single year of their life, they of their lifetime. They might be 60, 70 years old, but coming out and set them celebrating music is going or whatever, they're, they're supposed to be dancing, they be having a good time. It's like they, they want something. In the moment, they have won something. We have to learn to not just be about this moment, but be about a movement and create that movement within our own spaces and in our own, I heard of somebody said there's a clergy in the room, so I'm watching my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's political scene, you know, I'm watching my mouth. <laughs> 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 so that being said, how do we celebrate those wins on Sunday? You know, how do we how do we celebrate, you know, hey look, right down the street, y'all, y'all know what? We got a new, we got a light bulb in the light post that's been out for a, a month. That is a celebration, that is a win, because more than likely it's taking multiple calls to get that light bulb fixed. We have to learn to do those small things and, and to bring about the bigger change and look at it from a bigger perspective. I think something that has to do with the 365 things changing is passing on the sticks. I think the sticks need to be passed on to the young people. Like you said, what's something that a 25 year old can do? to make a change. I think one of those things is running for a city council, running for governor, changing, like you said, some of the things that affect people every day. I've been, I've heard about some of the things that city council do, and they be doing some dirty things, they aren't criminals that run for city council. And then there's young people that get in trouble for a grandma weed. I think changing those things and having young people run, we can celebrate young people running for city council. Because that's something that you can go back to over and over and over. You can become a candidate once, lose, go back, keep on running, be a candidate for city council. I feel like that's one step that has to do with passing on the sticks. But at the same time, that's going to bring a change that's local. So I mean, voting for a president, that's one thing. But voting locally, that's something that changes what you see down the block. And as we can celebrate that when it comes to physical scenes that we see, and the emotional, just a trend, just seeing trends, maybe making that trend. I don't know if try to take their pride and use it for their own benefit, because a lot of people do that already. But if it can become a trend that, hey, we're causing change, and young people are causing change, I feel like if that's a trend among older people and younger people, I feel like that's something that can be carried on and easily pass on the sticks if we both get involved in that. Because at the same time, younger people can do that. Because it takes a lot for someone to run for city council, because that's going to meeting, the meeting, the meeting, the meeting, going to talk, this, that, and the other. And I mean, there's a lot of people that don't want to sacrifice that, but they want change. So when it comes to voting, that's something that has to happen. But at the same time, if young people can go out and go, there's many reasons why people loot and riot, yes. But if people have that energy, that energy can go to other things. But at the same time, that door needs to be opened up. So I feel like for something that can happen on a day-to-day -day basis, running for governor, running for mayor, running for student council, that's just, I mean, I feel like that's one example that can cause a big change locally and for many big cities, but I feel like that's just one step. Can I add on what he said? Real quick. Yeah, great, great. Um, what I was gonna say is um, I'm from Greensboro, so in Greensboro, what I've, what I've noticed by working in these spaces and trying to build up the community is when you're building up the community, you get this, the crab in the bucket type deal, you know, where I've had people of my own community who literally hate me for no reason because I'm, I'm on the news or because they put me in a history museum or because I'm with Danielle on the tour right now and they hate to see it. So how do we, that's another narrative that we have to change is that when you got a, a 25 year old black man in the city council or a 25 year old government mayor in your city or a young black man in a position how do we change that effort where we're not hating on each other? Because that's another thing they've done in politics. They take it and they get a guy, they might take you. They'll put you up here and they'll make everybody in this room despise you because we don't have what you have. And that's what they figured out to do like a science. So at that same point, when we're, when we're running for these positions, we have our own community ripping and tearing at us for being in these positions. I'm not interested in, in getting involved in politics, being a politician. I'm curious, why, why is that? You were, you were very passionate about that. You want to be real honest? Real honest. It's a barbershop. I think we can all agree, and we all understand. 
Is this a white man's world? No. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. What? This is our world. Please explain. I think they are advantaged in this world, definitely. Definitely, they are advantaged in this world. We are strangers right now in somebody else's land. Strangers. When I was saying,
created the systems? And who are the systems created to benefit? And how do we get above and beyond those systems? So your mentality starts with, are right, those systems in place, but I'm not gonna allow the system to deter me. And I would say just one, one other thing, um, seeing others move that look like us and be in places of representation is empowering. That's all I have to say. Seeing those things and seeing people in positions of power, yeah, the power people. In 2008, my parents took me to Washington. I saw President Obama be inaugurated. I was there with the people. With my parents had buses just like the, the, the nice lady right here, just like that, filled with people. Mm -hmm. And I got to see that as a kid. So I know those things are achievable, but I also understand they also taught me to be realistic and to understand that. The, the cards are stacked against you, and like you said, you got to work twice as hard to get half as much. And to, you, you made great points. You made great points, and I agree with those, those, all those things. And I don't feel like I'm limited by my, by my abilities in any form, or any shape. But that's not the game I'm trying to play. I'm trying to put, trying to start these businesses and, and get my family involved and trying to make it where we don't have to depend on somebody else. We can depend on each other. That's powerful though. Hearing all, all y'all encourage each other, that's real too. Just that encouragement, like don't give up that power. That's encouraging. Yeah. Well, you begin to talk about systems and institutions and power. Okay, that's what this is built on, right? Systems, institution, and power. Right. So, as people who are embedded in the system. We also have to realize that in this system, in order to really gain and maintain your own voice, you have to be resistant to the system. And that means you won't have popularity, right? That means that if you're really truthful about the change, that mean that means you don't sit at every table, right? That also means you don't become a bought Negro. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because anybody that have made it, they can tell you that the minute they begin to think for themselves is the minute that the same folk that, that, that made us believe we owned it were the same people that cut the check too. And then it was those same people that they had to realize that if I'm gonna be authentically who I say I am and live my truth, then that means I can't be a part of the system. I have to stand outside the system. I, I have to own, and when you look at entertainment, you look at, you look at various sectors. I mean, even, even in my own world of, of religion and theology, those who have made the greatest impact are those who have lost the most. And when they were on the ascension, right, they were celebrated. But the minute they began to talk about truth that caused the, 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 the system to wrestle with itself is the minute that they didn't have no cause. But if you're truly who you say you are, you won't need the system. You'll figure out a way to do it yourself. And I'm talking about me. See, when I went into a, a particular denomination, I was celebrated, right? I, I, had a, I had a beautiful house, five-bedroom home. I lived near where the Cincinnati Bengals lived. But when Trayvon Martin happened, and I said something on social media, the very white people that were paying me or the very white people that made me pack my bags. But I'm here today because I refuse to be a damn broad nigga. That's real. But I, but, I, but I stand to be a prophetic preacher that is not afraid to call white supremacy what it is. See, what white people have is inherited 
Michael Eric Dyson talks about the inheritance of wealth. They didn't, they didn't earn that. that. That was inherited. And so if we're going to be who we are and true, you're going to have to resist the system. Jesus stood against the Roman Empire. That's how he died. King died when he started messing with white people money. He didn't die because of the speech in Washington. He died when he went to Memphis. When you start talking about wages, labor, that means deregulation. That means union. And they killed him. And they killed Jesus. One thing to that one, sister. I don't know if this was already covered, but um, I think in the 1920s, a lot of black business owners were lynched in Wilmington. I don't know if y'all already covered the history of Wilmington was going on. When it comes to that system, I don't, I really don't know how to take that head on because whenever black people were coming to political power in Wilmington back in the 19, early 1900s and whatnot, a lie, an old white woman had a lie and they put it in the newspaper that if black men come to power, I don't know if it was a black man raped a white woman, it's gonna happen more often if black men come to power, but that was said, you no know, spread in the newspapers. And Wilmington was turned upside down. Like, I don't know how to take on that system. So I just wanted to say that, I didn't know if y'all already addressed that history. How should that system be taken? Because that system hasn't slowed down whatsoever. There's new ways of taking on black business owners. It's not lynching them in the streets anymore, it's not destroying their businesses, but there's other ways when it comes to, oh, you can't get the same loans we have. Just, I mean, we all have. I so, don't know. Yeah. so I see systems a little bit differently in that, you know, I think systems are just, I think people sometimes talk about systems as some benevolent thing, or this thing that is, um, uh, you know, the, the, the man, the man is like a man of work. But, I, but, I, but I, I think that systems, I, I think I know that systems are made up of people. Right? Systems are made up of people, systems are made up of policy, systems are made up of the history, right? So people in that it's made up of our biases, our norms, our values, you know, the things that make us us as individuals, all of us, black, right? right? Policies that were put in place, historical, some that still exist today, new policies that are created every day create systems, right? So I don't know if it's a matter of stepping outside of the system, I don't know if that's possible, you know? It's a matter of influencing and changing systems, right? and how you do that. And the first thing you gotta do is understand systems and understand that aspect of it. Because it's a war of ideas, that's what it is, right? The systems, the systems that still exist are ideas, right? And policies based on ideas that people put in place, that have perpetuated, that have created a, a, a wealth gap based on social policy, right? Like you were saying, like we, this, this wealth gap is not something that, that that is something that white people did and something that we didn't do that somehow created this disparity. That was engineered by the American government. Those, those are social policies that created that wealth. But those were policies, those are ideas, those are values, those are biases that put those systems in place. And we're still dealing with them. But how you deal with them is to change the people, change ourselves, change each other, recognize our biases, work on, work on them, educate people, change policy, elect people, vote. That's how you change systems. You can't stand outside the system. And I, I'm a person, as a non-believer, as a free thinker, as a black free thinker raised in the church, you know, I know something about stepping outside of the thing and saying, no, nah, y'all do that, I'm gonna do something different. And how that can have negative. You know, I get that. But that, I still am a part of that system, right? When someone, when I hear someone say they're a devil worshiper, a part of me goes, huh, right? <laughs> right? But that's, that's just stuff that I got, that I'm a part of the system still. And I got, didn't have to remember, oh, well, that's just a thought of society, I don't believe in the devil, you good, right? So that's what we gotta figure out, that's what we first gotta understand in order to change the system, I think. I think, what I'm, what I'm, let me clarify, when I say step outside the system, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm talking about is not necessarily uh, being always gun hold for the system. Yes, we all benefit from the system, right? Because I benefit from being a part of the system. But at the same time, I have to be careful enough that I do not allow myself to become fooled. See, a lot of, a lot of Americanism is based on me fooling you to make you believe because you got the college education, 
right? Because you no longer have to live in government housing, which white people created for white women when their husbands were at war. So government housing is not something that is new. Am I right? This like socialism is not something that is new. Anything created by the government is what? It's been around, right? So to step outside the system is this idea of not, like James Cone talks about, is taking what is and finding yourself in it. And what you don't like about it, that's what you begin to critique. And that's what you begin to find ways to raise, <clears throat> to raise points of contention. James Cone was a black uh, AME preacher who had become dissatisfied with right Christianity, right? He became dissatisfied with it. So he took Martin and Malcolm, Martin for more of the Eurocentric Christianity idea and Malcolm for more of being the black critic. And he put them together and he created what we now know as black liberation theology that talks about how God sees me as a black man. And, and like Malcolm taking on my blackness and being proud of my blackness. So that's what I mean by being outside of Martin. Martin stepped outside the system and he took the very system and critiqued it. Took it and critiqued it. Took the very words of the slave master and used it against them. So you mean that philosophically? I mean that philosophically. Yes, I mean that philosophically. But I do feel there are ways to operate outside there, there, there are ways when you can create your own, your own spaces, your own, well, you, you know, there, there, there's a thing in music, and I was in music, there's a thing called independent artists, and signed artists. Most of the time, signed artists have the engine behind them. But the independent artist is the one who's generating it themselves. They are recording the music, they're creating the music, they're distributing the music, they're distributing to those who like their music, because everybody not going to like the music. So that's outside of the system of mainstream how music is distributed. That person is not operating with a with a with a record label. They are the record label. They they have to raise the money to record, to do all of the things that need to be done to get their music heard. So they're not operating within a particular system that says this is the way you have to do this if you want to be this particular mainstream artist. So outside of the system, you're saying basically stay true to yourself and, and stand behind what you believe in. That's exactly right. You do that in the system and you change the system. That's what I'm saying. When you do that, you're changing the system. You see what I'm saying? I also, I also think too, when you, when you talk about changing the system and, and maneuvering and all of that within the system, all that kind of good stuff, we have to take our own platforms. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have this platform. And I'm blessed to be able to stand in front of folks and speak on this platform. I'm also blessed to be able to take what I know, who I know, and navigate it into spaces that don't necessarily get that all the time. Um, I'm blessed to be able to say that when we talk about going into the rural communities, the ones that don't get no type of love, that ain't had no kind of mask, no leak, nothing over the last nine months, no, those are the, we're able to utilize our platform to do just that. Sometimes we have to take, a, a, a maneuvering in the system, we gotta take what we got and, and put it out there and make it work for us. And sometimes it's not about looking for somebody to work for us. Sometimes we gotta figure out how to make it work for ourselves by taking it into spaces that we know, we know that's where it needs to be. We know that's where it's gonna be if we take it there. So it's important that we understand our own system and our own platform and be able to take it into these places that don't necessarily get anything. You know, and be able to, the, the same way that we go out here and again, we go out here, we, we knock on people's doors, and we're trying to get them out here to vote. I mean, I got people in the woods knocking on people's doors, trying to get folks out here to vote. Those are the same time, we need to be doing that 365 on a conversational level of saying, hey, look, do you know about this? Do you know about that? 
Do you do you take that platform that you're given and go into these spaces to navigate the system to help change the system? Because the more people that you're talking to, the more you can have to help you change that system because you have the momentum to be able to do that. Um, is this system made for us? Absolutely not. We all know that. We all agree. That's the one thing we can agree on. It is not made for us. But how do, it's how do we take it and make it how that we can navigate through it? Um, I get asked all the time, how in the world can you go out here and ask people to vote knowing good and well ain't none of these candidates really for us? It's simple. I want to see some. I want to see some type of change. I want to see people believe in what they are changing. So I have to use me to be able to do that. My big mouth, my short self. I have to be able to use me to do that, and that's what I do. So if we start thinking along those lines. Not necessarily always think about how the system doesn't work for us, but how we can navigate and make it work for ourselves. We would think our our narrative will change and our frame of mind will change as part of it. You said it all. She said we got all the time. We just all use it. I'm assuming that when we think about solutions, um, you just got you, you pose a question, and I'm sitting here thinking. I listen to what you said about your community. One of the greatest issues we have right now. That we don't have succession, right? There's no, there's no who's next. Right. Um, and when we look back to even being in Chrome Wilkinson, one of the greatest leaders I saw in our community was Mr. William Murphy. When he passed away, we didn't know who's next. Mm -hmm. um, and so somebody comes along and they start doing the work. And because you weren't identified as right. being next by the by the generation that preceded you, that's why you caught all that flag. So this is how we solve it. As a community, we have to hold our leaders accountable, not to just lead, but mentorship, even discipleship. Because when Jesus ascended, we knew Peter was next. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's one of the greatest solutions that we can have, is being able to submit ourselves as mentors, but then also submitting ourselves on another level as mentees. We have to get out of the thought that we are, we're, we're past learning, we're past being poured into, because we lead in certain situations, I have mentees, but I have a team of mentors. Um, and we have to be able to say, all right, who's next? Even on a different level. Right now, Sharp is getting old. Who's next? If we're being honest, we're in a barbershop. Who's next? That's when we begin to believe because we know that the knowledge and the wisdom was passed down to somebody by a person that we saw doing the work. So then you don't have those issues that you run into back home because you were, for lack of a better term, anointed as next. Hands were laid on you. You were identified by the ones who were already doing the work. And it creates a different sense of energy in our communities because we can now get behind you because the ones that we knew were doing it and succeeded have now said, this guy's carrying the ball. There's a young man here. He's done a lot of great work, but he's been identified by the elders as somebody who can get the job done. Sometimes the community will get with you, sometimes they won't. But the leaders gotta lead. And as a community, we gotta be able to say, who, who are y'all pouring into? Yeah, we're doing the work, but who's next? Is there a way to decentralize that? Because I, I'm always uncomfortable when, when individuals become the face of organizations, right? I mean, because you know, we're all frail, right? I mean, we're all talented. And, and I see what happened in Florida with Gillum, and you know, stuff like that makes me uncomfortable. Is there, is there a way to have leadership, because that's important, but in a way that is decentralized, that, that one individual does not become the movement? It's difficult, but the problem is everybody doesn't have the gift of leadership. Yeah. Um, yes. Everybody doesn't have that. Let's do this. We, um, it's about 7.30, but let's wrap up the night on that. Like, <clears throat> we represent a few different generations in here. We can't change the world without first making that impact in our own circle of influence. So what do we do to make that change? Like, when I say that, take it personal. What, what does Sean do? What do you do? What does each individual do in here to make sure that my man got next? Whoever my man is, my woman got next, whoever that person. I think that, to even to add to that, one of the things that I've, I've noticed that we do in our community is we don't own our spaces. Black Voters Matter is doing the work in the community to make sure that we're engaged. 
I don't necessarily need to go paint in their room when I know I have a room that I'm assigned to. We do, we do a great job of telling everybody what they need to do better, but we don't own it when we know that there's things that we need to do better. If everybody owned their space and killed it, we would be a lot better off. But what happens is we, we own a thing, and because we own a thing and we're doing well, we automatically anoint ourselves, again, we're back at succession, we anoint ourselves for what everybody else is doing. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not okay. To your point, I get what you're saying about, I don't like there being a platform person at the, at the forefront of a, of a movement. However, everybody, everybody can't lead and everybody can't stand up under that level of criticism either. Um, and so it's, it's unfair to put people in situations that even though you, you can have a whole bunch of trainers and a whole bunch of teachers, but char if, if their character is not strong enough to stand up under it, you set a whole movement behind by trying to decentralize but decentralizing it and spreading that responsibility out. It, I would love for it to work that way, but unfortunately, you need somebody at the front. I give you an example, bro. Like I'm telling you, I've seen people come out here just to be on the news, just to be on TV, just to get Instagram likes, but then when the crowd died down, when the hype ain't the same, the girls ain't out there marching with us no more. Yeah. You know, it changes up. Yeah. And then on top of that, it's a lot of mental pressure. You don't get to spend a lot of time with your family. You don't get to, like, I was helping my grandma, my mama. I'm gone now. My grandma getting sick. She got COVID, all of that. And then she got sicker because there wasn't nobody there to help her. But somebody got to make, make that sacrifice. And everybody's not going to make that sacrifice. A lot of people talking, but they're not really about it. And then when you put them at, in that position, they fold, and then we all got to pay the price for it. Exactly. You will never have a movement without a movement maker. You can go through our history and look. Every single movement was started by a movement. Jesus is the primary example of that. Um, but just to circle back, the question at hand is, what does each individual do? What does Sean do? What does every individual in here, male, female, whatever generation you represent, what do you do to ensure that the movement moves on, that the next generation is next up? Like, who's got next? We often say, man, who is that? But what am I doing? For, for example, I'll begin. I, I have all daughters, but I'm ensuring my daughters I don't really like to use the term world, but my daughters know what's going on. And anyone that I have a circle of influence with, I try to pour them in as well, and allow myself to be poured, poured into as well. So what are we doing as an individual to ensure that the next person that's coming up is next? Because you're not gonna have, we can decentralize whatever you want, but you're not gonna have a movement without a movement maker. So how do we ensure that that next movement is going on? I get what you're saying. Personally, for me, I have, I'm blessed to be able to be in a lot of rooms at a lot of tables. Um, and I've been doing this for, for years now. The information I get, I always bring back. And, and when I say that, you know, in a more formal way, like, I teach classes. Um, I, I start at home, I have four kids and a wife. But as far as me own, owning and manning my stuff, I know for a fact that the generation from about 13 to 30, that's my crew. And I, and I gotta do everything I can to make sure that they're appropriately informed about whatever it is they're looking for as it pertains to what my expertise is. I work in finance. Um, I work in finance and I operate in faith. So as, as it pertains to those, those, two, those two segments, I have to own that and trust the fact that everybody else is gonna do their part.
even if they even if they fell a little bit, there was somebody that stepped out and said, "Hold up, we got you." We have to learn to to, to understand. Our folks ain't perfect. We are not perfect. And when we do, when we begin to understand that, we have that understanding. We put that in perspective, and not just put people on this pedestal to where when they do fall, we we have this huge disappointment. We got something to talk about and all this other kind of stuff. We have to learn that it is important that we understand who we are yeah. and bring ourselves to the table yeah. and surround ourselves with people that got that have us. Yeah. Um, that's so important. We can't move without people that have us. We understand our role. We under, y'all get we ain't perfect, and if something happens, then we're good to go. Andrew Gill, perfect example of that. Perfect example. Yeah. Everybody in this country was behind this man for government. He did not win. But when his true colors came out of who he was and what happened, everybody had something to say. And everybody turned their back on him, even, even after the fact. Yeah. So we have to understand, we ain't perfect. We gotta come to that understanding. And when we come to that understanding, we'll be a whole lot better off and be able to operate in our own a little bit better and be able to say, you know what? I made, I messed up, I did this, I did that, I did that great, whatever. We'll be able to operate in that a little bit better than, than just holding these game changers and these makers up to these pedestals where they have no room to fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. I want to be clear that I personally, I, I still look to Black Panther Bill. Like I'm not, I'm not, I was not trying to, to insinuate that because of what happened to him that it was appropriate what happened to him. But what I was saying is that that's what happens, right? right. <laughs> because because that's how that's because we do exalt individuals who are in these positions as a society. That's what we do, mm -hmm. right? And then those people who are and and technical that are technical to what it is we're trying to do right. will try to recognize. <laughs> We'll try to recognize right. um, those right. failures as human beings, or, or yeah. frailties, or imperfections. So that's that's my point. Is is how do we deal with that? Because because I think it's important. I hate to see a movement collapse because we have not decentralized in some way. You know what I'm saying? Whether that's right or wrong. You know, I would hate to see a lot of work fall to the wayside because we are not taking the initiative to exalt other people who may be talented, to right. find that talent, to, to bring those people and sit them next to us and say, we are here representing this cause, so that it's not one person that, that, that basically holds it all in their, in, their, in their hands. And to that young gentleman's point, the reason why I asked him why he wasn't going to run is because I'm very political. I, I, I think that I, I would that would be something I would love to get involved in if I was interested in the bullshit, right? I'm not interested in the bullshit at all, right? I'm also not. Uh, I'm also a non-believer, right? And so for a long time, I knew. When you say non-believer, what do you mean? I'm an agnostic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So for a long time, I knew <laughs> there was no way that I could make any political headways, you know, with with, with as a non-believer, right? Right. So so to your point. That has now has a lot to do with us and what we expect leaders to be. The, 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 how we exalt them, the imperfections we expect them to be, the way we expect them to mirror exactly who we are, um, that is a problem. And, and to me, one way to to expect it, because it's not right, but we need to expect it and figure out a way to decentralize that power so that we can those movement makers can, can have other individuals that individuals that hold them up that they can tap for what's next. You know what I mean? Right. But the movement should start on the shoulders of a movement maker, but it can't live on the back of the movement maker. Yeah. Like it starts on the shoulders, but it can't live on the back of the movement maker. And that's that's all of us. Aaron and Moses, we get it biblically. But it can't just reside on one individual. So out of respect for time, because we got children and everyone else, I, I just want to wrap up. Absolutely. <laughs> You got strong black women who without them, we wouldn't be shit. Let's call it like it is. Right. And so the, these are the people that we got to bring into these spaces where it's just not a whole bunch of men just swapping men ideas. 
You know what I'm saying? Like we need women up here too, black women up here too, like talking their ideas too. So I'm gonna close the conversation out tonight with the conversation that Hill and I had. She said, um, did you just send me these questions as informational purposes only, or am I supposed to be a part of this? I'm like, absolutely, you spoke. She's like, I, cause I'm not trying to encroach on a, on, on a man's conversation. I'm like, nah, our space is your space. We need your voice, because your voice is powerful. But that's not you have four brothers. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so to your point, I co-sign everything that you're just saying, and we need representation beyond a black male, regardless of um, the age. We need our representation there, and that's what continues the power of the movement. So I want to thank every single person for coming out here tonight. Tonight was fire. I appreciate what you did. I appreciate uh, City Cuts. You guys are amazing. A round of applause. <laughs> so yeah, I, I appreciate the cut, but you brothers and sisters made the evening. I hope that you guys were encouraged. Uh, I, all I want to say is this is not the, the ending, this is the beginning. And November the 3rd is not the end point. It's not a destination. It's when we pass the baton off and continue to move forward. Yeah. So again, give yourselves a round of applause. You guys are amazing.